The elements of design are as follows. We have line, shape, value, color, texture, pattern, form, and, and this one's debatable, space, because really space is the absence of an element. First off, let's take a look at line. And here's some examples that I created in Adobe Illustrator. And you'll notice that they vary in thickness, they vary in style. The third one down there shows a dash. The fourth one is also a dashed line, but it has rounded ends on the dash. And the fifth one down is, um, it's got a tail feather and it's got an arrowhead on it. We've now got in the fifth example, what we would call a compound line. That's multiple lines all joined end to end. You'll notice that these compound lines are open. If I were to end my line back where I started, that would in fact create an enclosed space and that would constitute a shape. The final one, as you can see, has a brush texture added to it. It's still a line, but it has brush attributes that are applied to it. We'll take a look at an example of where line might be used by an artist or a designer. And here we've got a very complex assemblage of lines portrayed here. And they're all kind of synthesized together into what's known as a gestalt or gestalt. These are all just lines taken in and of themselves. They're fairly simple, straight lines. But when arranged in a certain way, our brains synthesize them into a form that detects something of the familiar. In this case, it's a cross-section of a wood plane. These sorts of things, these line drawings as they're called, are often used by designers and artists to uh, render technical drawings, almost like drafting. And drafting would also be an example of that. The next element is shape. Now you'll notice that these are enclosed. We have simple graphic primitives like the square and rectangle, the circle or the ellipses, the triangle, which is part of the polygons, multi-sided closed objects. And this is also a polygon, but it's a special case. It's a star where the inside um, corners are determined by a radius and the outside corners of the star are determined by a second radius. The final example on the far right is a very organic closed shape and these would be shapes that typically would be found in nature very loosely structured the first four i created using the pen tool which is um, like a technical drawing tool and the final example the organic shape i used the pencil tool which is very much a freeform drawing tool now just to take a look at how shape is used by artists and designers we we'll just take a look at this art by Stuart Davis, and it's called The Mellow Pad, and that's from 1945 to 1951. Just take a look, ignoring the type obviously, but he's using an assemblage of shapes which all taken together form an overall impression or gestalt. Our next element of design or art is called value. And value represents the tints or the relative degree of white and black that exists in a form. It aids in implying the presence of a light and shadow um, as suggested in the image that we're looking at here. And I've suggested a planetary composition. That's the impression that it gives that there's a light source beyond the frame of the image um, and that it's impacting really what are just circles. I've just applied value to them to suggest the sculpting of three-dimensional spheres. This is an image by George Surratt from 1883. It's just a seated nude. And you can see how Monsieur Surratt is using tone to imply um, sources of light and their complementary shadows. Another element of art and design is color. 
and color represents the visual spectrum of light as it interacts on the natural world. It imparts a natural vibration frequency of light that mimics the effect of light and pigment in the actual real world. However, it can be used to transcend the physical world if it's used symbolically and psychologically to impart moods, emotions, or other ethereal kind of spiritual dimensions to a work. So color is a very powerful element. And the example I've given you here is from Vasily Kandinsky from 1908, Autumn Landscape with Boats. It just gives this an intense quality um, that's almost dreamlike. That's that ethereal quality. Another element of art is pattern. And that's created by the repetition of elements. And this repetition generates rhythm. It can create a sense of balance or harmony. And the patterns can range from being man-made, in which case we're looking at here, they're very regular, geometric. Um, and that's in contrast what we, with what we might find in the natural world. You know, if we looked at um, patterns on bark, patterns on leaves, the repetitious patterns on any number of things like a tortoise shell and so on, um, they're a little more random and organic. The example I've given here is uh, The Kiss by Gustav Klimt, 1908. We can see the use of pattern here. It's taking what's really very much um, almost an iconic line drawing, very flat, not much in the way of tonality, um, where we're getting life breathed into the images through the use of pattern. And so it tends to lift that fabric that the lovers are wrapped in um, and elevate it and kind of lift it off the page. And it puts it in stark contrast with the color and the pattern of the surface on which they're kneeling at this point. So the use of exquisite differenti differentiated patterns generate a rich visual tapestry that compensates for the lack of value here. The pattern effect wades into being very close to texture, particularly in the floral element at the bottom. Speaking of texture, um, that brings a sense of tactility, a sense of touch to a work through repetitive elements, much like pattern, um, whose contours and interplay of light and shadow mimic the surface qualities of objects in the real world. And that allows the audience to connect a motosensory dimension to the experience of the work. They can literally feel it in some ways. And here's an example from the work of Eric Pevernagy, Post Restance from 2016. And it's a little bit difficult to see here, but the envelopes have almost no texture and the area around them are highly textured, um, kind of stuccoed type feel. And uh, you have a sense that if you ran your fingers across that, you know what that would feel like. The five, this one here, uh, this element, form, it's volumetric in nature. So it creates a physical volume of a shape, and then it displaces the volume of space occupied by it. So it's an interrelationship, the thing and the space that it eats up or consumes. In sculpture, volume is removed in order to reveal the form that lies beneath the medium. So if you think of a sculptor with a block of marble, they're actually removing and adding space in where none existed in order to reveal the underlying form. You can view this as either the removal of object or the addition of space around the object. Now these volumetric forms are 3D, but we, as we saw earlier with my composition under value, um, it can be implied through the use of perspective and tone in 2D form. An example I've given here, one of the oldest uh, sculptures extant, uh, is the Venus of Holofels 
and that stems from around 3,500 years before the Common Era. Now, form really came to its zenith uh, in classical Greece, and here we've got a sample of Aphrodite, and she's from around 330 to 146 um, before the Common Era, or BCE.